Hi, I'm Congressman Bobby Scott, and I'm going to read from an excerpt of a legal memo signed by Assistant Attorney General for the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, Jay Bobby. The August 1, 2002 memo addresses the proposed interrogation of a detainee named Abu Zabeda. And I'm Congressman Keith Ellison, and I'll be reading excerpts from Abu Zabeda's firsthand account of his interrogation in a secret CIA prison. Abu Zubaydah's testimony is included in a report by the International Committee for the Red Cross about the treatment of detainees in U.S. custody. The memo. You have asked for this office's views on whether certain proposed conduct would violate the prohibition against tor torture found in Section 2340A of Title 18 of the United States Code. You have asked for this advice in the course of conducting interrogations of Abu Zubaydah in light of the information you believe Zabeda has and the high level of threat you believe now exists, you wish to move the interrogations into what you have, have described as an increased pressure phase. This phase is likely to last no more than several days, but could last up to 30 days. About two and a half or three months after I arrived in this place, the interrogation began again, but with more intensity than before. Then the real torturing started. In this phase, you would like to employ 10 techniques that you would believe will dislocate his expectations regarding the treatment he believes he will receive and encourage him to disclose the crucial information mentioned above. These 10 techniques are, one, attention grasp, two, walling, three, facial hold, four, facial slap, insult slap, five, cramped confinement, six, wall standing, seven, stress positions, eight, sleep deprivation, nine, insects placed in a confinement box, and ten, the waterboard. You have informed us that you expect these techniques to be used in some sort of escalating fashion, culminating with the waterboard, though not necessarily ending in this technique. Two black wooden boxes were brought into the room outside my cell. One was tall slightly higher than me and narrow, measuring perhaps one meter by three quarters of a meter and two meters in height. The other was shorter, perhaps only one meter in height. I was taken out of my cell and one of the interrogators wrapped a towel around my neck. They then used it to swing me around and smash me repeatedly against the hard walls of the room. I was also repeatedly slapped in the face. As I was still shackled, the pushing and pulling around meant that the shackles pulled in painfully on my ankles. Cramped confinement involves the placement of an individual in a confined, in a confined space, the dimensions of which restrict the individual's movement. The confined space is usually dark. The duration of confinement varies based on the size of the, con of the container. For the larger confined space, the individual can stand up or sit down. The smaller space is large enough for the subject to sit down. Confinement in the largest space can last up to 18 hours. For the smaller space, confinement lasts for no more than two hours. I was then put into the tall box for what I think was about one and a half to two hours. The box was totally black on the outs inside as well as the outside. It had a bucket inside to use as a toilet and had water to drink provided by a bottle. They put a cloth of cover over the outside of the box to cut out the light and restrict my air supply. It was difficult to breathe. For walling, a flexible false wall will be constructed. The individual is placed with his heels touching the wall. The interrogator pulls the individual forward and then quickly and firmly pushes the individual into the wall. It is the individual's shoulder blades that hit the wall. During this motion, the head and neck are supported with a rolled hood or towel that, that provides a sea collar effect to help prevent whiplash. To further reduce the probability of injury, the individual is allowed to rebound from the flexible wall. You have orally informed us that the false wall is in part constructed to create a loud sound when the individual hits it, which will further shock and surprise the individual. In part, the idea is to create a sound that will make the impact seem far worse than it is and that will be far worse than any injury that might result from the action. When I was let out of the box, I saw that one of the walls of the room had been covered with plywood sheeting. From now on, it was against the wall, this wall, 
that I was then smashed with a towel around my neck. I think the, that the plywood was there to provide some absorption of the impact of my body. The interrogators realized that smashing me against the wall would probably quickly result in physical injury. During these torture sessions, many guards present, plus two interrogators who did the actual beating, still asking questions, which the main interrogator left to return when the beating was over. After the beating, I was then placed in a small box. They placed a cloth or cover over the box to cut out all light and restrict my air supply. As it was not high enough to even sit upright, I had to crouch down. It was very difficult because of my wounds. The wound on my leg began to open and started to bleed. I don't know how long I remained in the small box. I think I may have slept or maybe fainted.